yards like this around our houses. Um, what are the functions of these yards? Do they serve an ecosystem function? No, not at all. In fact, they're pretty harmful to the ecosystem. Nothing much eats this grass. Um, you may see robins out there eating worms. Uh, I think Canada geese eat grass, say no more. Um, fossil fuels are used up to mow the lawn. Uh, people have to buy machinery. Poisonous chemicals are used to fertilize and as pesticides. Lawns use 9 billion gallons of water nationwide per day. And homeowners use more pesticides than the entire United States agriculture industry. So uh, none of that is good. So we need to repurpose our yards. As landowners, we have an obligation to restore native habitat to our yards for the wildlife. We can always buy a house somewhere else and move. They cannot, they don't have that choice. So we need to maintain and restore the ecosystem rather than destroying it. And we start with native plants. And those build up a foundation for pollinators, um, native bees, birds, other wildlife, et cetera. We'll use fewer non-renewable resources. We'll stop polluting the environment. And we'll enjoy the surprises and delights of nature, which is something that I look forward to every morning. Every morning I go out, walk around my yard, see what's happening out there. And it's always uh, fun to do. So how do we restore our yards? We know we want to plant native plants because insects won't eat non-natives. We want to plant keystone plants. And these are the 5% of plants that are food for 73% of caterpillars. Lepidoptera are uh, moths, butterflies, skippers. And keystone plants have leaves that are host leaves that feed caterpillars. We also want specialist plants because not all caterpillars will eat keystone plant leaves. And I'll give you some examples of that. We want the Lepidoptera, we want those caterpillars. Um, Dr. Dan's gonna be talking to you about the number of caterpillars that birds can actually consume and it's quite amazing. So uh, even birds that you think might be seed eaters need to, to feed caterpillars to their young as a rule. And then there are other essential aspects of building habitat. Um, just the living plants themselves aren't enough habitat. The leaves, the dead leaves that fall off trees in the fall are habitat. Uh, we call them, what do we call them? Leaf litter, right? They're not litter, they're habitat. They're an actual layer in my woods. Um, Lights at night, berries for birds. Other speakers are going to speak about these, but I would like to throw in one good word about leaf habitat before we move on. If you're wondering what makes it so good, do you like luna moths? Who doesn't like luna moths? They're incredibly beautiful animals. Fireflies, we all complain that we're seeing fewer fireflies. Well, they need leaf habitat to overwinter in. Bumblebee queens need leaf habitat to overwinter in. And all of these species overwinter in leaf litter, leaf litter, leaf habitat, or slightly under the ground. So if you are burning your leaves, or if you are chopping them up, or disposing of them, you're getting rid of all that life in your yard that would come back in the spring. So moving on to research. And I'm going to go over my time here, and I hope my fellow speakers will forgive me, but I did give a long introduction. So um, several questions will come up as you're researching plants. First of all, how can you find a keystone plant? The place to go to do that is this uh, URL at the top of the screen. And remember, if you want a PDF of this presentation, just write your email address on the index card and you'll get it. If you put your zip code into this uh, website, it will give you back the top keystone plants. What do we mean by that? It's gonna rank plants by the number of caterpillar species they host. What do we mean by host? Caterpillars that eat the plants. So for example, in Arkansas, um, I don't think you can see what's up there, but oaks 
are the number one keystone plants in Arkansas. They will support over 400 species of caterpillars in central Arkansas. Okay, they're followed by um, cherries, beech, hickories, willow, crab apple, maple, and poplar. But there's a big drop off between oaks and the next following tree, which is cherries. So uh, this will not only give you numbers for trees and shrubs, but it will also give you numbers for grasses and flowering plants. So for example, if you search under grasses and flowering plants and you look up goldenrod, you'll see that's the number one plant in Arkansas. It hosts number one flowering plant. It hosts over 80 species of caterpillars. Goldenrod is a real powerhouse food-wise. So that's your source for keystone plants. What about specialist plants? Why do we even need those if we have the keystones? Well, this is one example. This photo is from my yard. Um, this is a, a giant swallowtail butterfly caterpillar, and it's on a wafer ash leaf. These caterpillars only live on, I think, three, maybe four species in the state of Arkansas, and wafer ash is one of them. If you don't have one of those species in your yard, you're not going to see these caterpillars. Same with fritillary butterflies, and the Diana fritillary is the state butterfly of Arkansas. Fritillaries need violets for their caterpillars to eat. So if you don't have violets in your yard, you're not going to have fritillary caterpillars. These are two examples of specialists. I know Leslie Cooper is going to be talking to you about another uh, very famous type of specialist, so I'll leave that for her. Another question that people ask all the time is, where can I buy these native plants? Because if you go to most of our garden centers, you are not going to see a native plant there. If you do see one, it's going to be a cultivar. And I'll have a few words to say about those right at the end. You have a handout that you got as you walked in. That's a handout to native plant sellers in central Arkansas. Hot off the presses, I visited each one of these plant sellers to write up the handout. So, um, so you've got a nice guide. If you're looking at a plant and you know its name, how can you tell whether it's a native or not? Um, one way is by using Theo's books, but most of us don't carry those around with us wherever we go, a few of us do. Um, another way is with a cell phone and using the BoneApp website. And some people may think BoneApp is an app. No, it's not, it's a website. Uh, it just has this unfortunate name, um, which preceded apps. So let's use the white oak as an example. Um, if you are looking at a white oak and you want to know whether it's a native, type in the genus with Bonap. So Google Bonap Quercus, and you'll see maps for every single Quercus species that has been recorded in the United States. This is the map for Quercus alba. You're going to see a whole page of maps, so you need to find the right species. And the green means it's a native. Okay. But what if you're looking at um, Lagerstremia indica? That's a big name. That happens to be crepe myrtle. If you type in Bonap Lagerstremia, you're going to see blue. Blue means that it's not native. And in fact, crepe myrtle is native nowhere in the United States, at least the continental United States. So. Oftentimes, when I'm trying to decide whether I want to buy a plant, I want to know uh, more about it. Will it flourish in my site conditions? <clears throat> do, we, do bees visit it? And these are some websites that you can go for answers to this question. My favorite is Illinois Wildflowers, not because I'm from Illinois, which I am, but because it, uh, in my opinion, has the best information about connections with animals. So it will tell you whether bees visit the, the plant, um, whether the plant produces pollen as well as nectar or only one, whether deer eat the plant, et cetera. So it's a good source. These others are the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, uh, the North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. And again, if you want the PDF of this presentation, then put your name on a card and your email. All right. Almost done. So 
When you go buy plants, if you are not going to a native plant seller, and even if you do, because they sell a few cultivars, typically, most of them, but not all of them, um, you will see a third name. The first name here is Phlox, that's the genus. The second is Divericata, that's the species. And the third name is the cultivar name. And you can tell it's a cultivar because it's in single quotation marks. That gives it away, okay? Um, and also it's, it's not Latin, it's, it's gonna be some English name. So cultivars are created by humans. They're not products of nature. Many are sterile. They don't have genetic diversity like wild plants do. Many have altered characteristics that decrease their ability to serve as hosts or provide pollen and nectar. So in short, Here's some cultivar advice that's based on a fair amount of research that's been done. If you're looking at a dwarf cultivar, usually that's okay and pollinators won't be affected um, and it won't suffer as a host plant, but double blooms are bad. It's a bad idea to buy a cultivar with double bloom that usually interferes with pollinators. Changed leaf colors, leaves that are colored red or purple are typically uh, not visited as much by the insects that would eat those leaves. And another uh, thing that we now know is that insects can see ultraviolet and many flowers and leaves have ultraviolet coloring on them that interacts with the pollinators. We can't tell whether our cultivars are affecting uh, the ultraviolet colors at all. So. For more information, you can go to the Mount Cuba Center and see if Mount Cuba has done research. There are a few cultivars that are good for pollinators. Uh, I don't wanna say they're all bad, but unless you've done your research and you know definitively whether it's a good cultivar, um, you might wanna be wary of them. So last topic is neighbors. Three points I'd like to make. One is be purposeful, okay? Growing a native garden doesn't mean stopping mowing the lawn. That's not growing a native garden, okay? Um, Benjamin Vogt, who has done many, many webinars and written a couple of books, suggests that 25% of your yard be hardscape, plants, paths, uh, sorry, paths, benches, arbors, bird baths, et cetera. Don't let your plants encroach on public sidewalks. Um, if they're growing in the parkway, <clears throat> don't plant tall plants. There's an excellent list by Lissa Morrison that you can find on the internet, well-behaved Arkansas natives. I highly recommend that if you're kind of growing for your natives or for your neighbors. Um, so he offers lots of good advice. He also says that if people put up signs explaining what they're doing, that their neighbors are less likely to report them because their neighbors have more of an idea about what's going on. And education is a big part of this if your neighbors are capable of being educated. Not all of them are, but some of them are. And so finally, if you're anticipating trouble from your homeowners association or from code enforcement, it's really a good idea to understand what you're doing and keep records. Maintain a list of all of the natives in your garden. Be able to explain why you've planted each species and how it contributes to the ecosystem. And I would just like to leave you with this last slide. These are some of the natives in my garden. And just as it's my home, it's the home of all these plants and animals too. And I know that I do have a responsibility to them. And I hope you all feel that way too. And today we're gonna to learn a lot about how we can carry out that responsibility. Thank you.
Oh, I can't just go to it? Well, it is open. It's on a screen. Oh, that's that window. Well, then he can go to it. He can go to it. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Okay, you're going to have to come down here for everybody. All right. I noticed that. Already, what I was looking for. Um, quick. Um. Lynn, did this work? Hmm. Does Hercules work? Nope. Nathan. It worked for me. I used this the whole time. Ethan? No, you just need to put in PowerPoint somewhere with mm -hmm. the prompts so that it will send them. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Theo Witzel. I'm going to talk a little bit about looking to natural areas and natural communities, wild places in Arkansas that are still intact, which, as Lynn mentioned, is a dwindling uh, proportion of the landscape. And uh, you're going to do that to get an understanding of plants and how they might work together in your garden or fit well with a particular site that you're working with. Arkansas, like anywhere in the world, is not a uniform place very different depending on where you are. And there's all these variations across the landscape in terms of geology and landform, hydrology, or the way the water interacts with the moisture in the landscape, interacts with the flora, et cetera. And so all of that needs to be taken into account. Um, I've been for about 25 years studying these native landscapes, and that's actually how I got into gardening with natives. I started to become interested in the flora, and it's kind of contagious, as I'm sure you all know. And before long, I was trying to grow a lot of the plants, uh, many unsuccessfully. I learned a lot over the last couple of decades trying this stuff. Um, I've come to view the landscape in what I call, or along what I call the prairie to forest continuum. And I think it's a useful um, way to understand not just the flora, but the fauna and the natural communities uh, of, our, of our state. So on one extreme or one end of the spectrum, you have grasslands, treeless, naturally treeless grasslands, and the flora and fauna that depend on that sort of a habitat. Uh, we call these prairies. There's actually more than just the, you know, the strict definition of prairies. Um, but these are naturally treeless areas. And our, nat our native grasslands are not a challenge this idea that they're early successional habitats. They're really not. They're ancient relic ecosystems that evolved over thousands of years. And uh, the few remaining examples that we have intact are literally old growth grasslands. And they're thousands of years old and the species that live there assembled over long time periods and are very tied to that, the land, the land um, scape and the land form, the soils geology, et cetera. And these are some of these remnants just to inspire you about the sort of flora here. This is, uh, uh, this, this is Baker Prairie Natural Area. It's one of the state system of natural area properties at Harrison. It's the highest quality remnant of a chert prairie, a chert bedrock under the soil there, uh, left in Arkansas. Incredible biological diversity. Uh, very different site here. Some of the same plant species you might see in the photo, but this is a, a shale pan prairie in the Arkansas Valley near, near Charleston, Arkansas. Uh, called Flanagan Prairie Natural Area. I took this photo uh, the last week of May, a couple years ago, 
and you can see the incredible uh, diversity of perennial wildflowers. And we call them tall grass prairies uh, because of four species of tall grasses, Indian grass, or switchgrass, Indian grass, big and little blue stem. Uh, these are just four of over a hundred species of grasses native to these ecosystems. But um, that's where that name kind of comes from. But they're really loved for the rich diversity of, in many cases, very long lived um, perennial wildflowers. There's also some annuals and biennials and things, but a lot of them are long lived perennial plants and they're excellent garden plants for sunny sites. Uh, I don't have time to get into them, Let's get the PDF of the presentation and, and read the names, but I guess just briefly we'll say there's a dozen species of blazing star or liatris in Arkansas grasslands, two species of Indian paintbrush, over 50 species of native beans and peas, five species of echinacea, 21 native milkweeds, uh, half a dozen species of rosinweed or compass plant, about eight species of beard tongue, several species of black-eyed Susans, three meadow beauties, 16 native sunflowers, five species of false indigo, and the list just goes on and on and on. Over 3,000 plant species uh, known from Arkansas, and uh, over 75% of those are considered native here. And check out the Atlas, which is available online uh, as a free download. Uh, see me afterwards for more information. Uh, as maps of all of those species. Um, going in the wrong direction, I apologize. Um, Natural grasslands are more than just grass. They're that wildflower component, which of course is the nectar resource. And as Lynn talked about, the foundation for all the biodiversity. Uh, they're also more than just plants at all. Uh, they're insect, you can go into a high quality prairie remnant, you can hear it. You can hear the buzz of all the insects. It's pretty remarkable. And the diversity that you'll see will just defy your imagination. Where were these grasslands? These are the large grasslands. This is a map from the 200 year old land survey of the Louisiana Purchase, and it shows where the surveyors mapped treeless grasslands in Arkansas. Um, over probably, this is actually a low ball estimate. We probably had close to one and a half, maybe even 2 million acres of treeless grasslands at the time of European settlement in the early 1800s. And another neat thing about these grasslands is as you go through the year, the growing season, the flora of each successive wave of plants that are blooming is taller than the last. Uh, if you go out there now, these plants are ankle high, uh, the violets, the Indian paintbrush, the low plants blooming. As you go later in the year, they're taller, you get waist high, um, cone flowers. By midsummer, the compass plant up at Baker Prairie here is eight feet tall. And so they're getting their nectar resource, their, their flowers up above for pollinators, they're competing for light and moving upward. You can plan the garden in the same sort of way. Related to prairies are glades, and glades are naturally treeless openings in an otherwise forested area. And uh, I like glades because they're so biologically diverse, but also if you have an extreme site, say a rocky area with bedrock close to the ground, uh, there's a whole world of glade flora that, that are, are great um, aspects. And, and as I mentioned, they're naturally treeless openings, otherwise forested area. And they occur primarily, but not exclusively, in the mountain counties of the state. Uh, there's a lot of glades in central Arkansas. Glades are classified based on the bedrock geology type they have. Um, high pH, limestone, a dolomite have different flora than an acidic sandstone or shale glade, for example. Uh, this is an example of a, a dolomite glade in southern Missouri uh, that's been restored to high quality conditions. Glades have a lot of rare or endemic restricted to um, th that habitat flora. So there are species that are found only, for example, in dolomite glades and nowhere else in the world, no other habitat type, uh, such as this uh, echinacea paradox of this yellow cone flower in this picture. Uh, this is an ovaculite glade, a type of real hard chert, silica rich rock in the Washitas. Uh, it has its own suite of rare and endemic plant species. And my personal favorite are the shale glades or barrens of the Washitas. Very high species diversity uh, and, and many species that have declined dramatically, but are excellent garden plants. Uh, the rarest type of glade we have is probably this type, the Nepheline cyanite, so a type of igneous rock similar to granite, occurs only in central Arkansas. And you can see that there's cactus in this, in this photo, or you maybe can see, there's cactus in the photo. Um, and that brings me to this next point. Glades are basically mini deserts, and they, have, they may be seasonally very wet, but they're extremely dry in the summer, their driest habitat. 
Uh, there's many, uh, everything that survives there, the plants are adapted to extreme summer drought and heat. We put some sensors in glades that measured the temperature and in July, glades in Saline County were 145 degrees. And the plants are able to survive that. So you got a rough sight. Some of these desert succulents found in our glades are excellent. We probably have, we don't even know how many species of cactus we have native here. We thought it was two when I started uh, working. We now recognize at least four and some experts say we probably have as many as eight or nine native cacti in our glades in Arkansas. Um, other desert succulents like this false aloe and this rock pink uh, store water in their leaves. And these are where glades are in the state. We have a great new map showing glades uh, across the state, nine different types. Uh, all this is available online. Uh, moving down the continuum, we get to savanna, which are essentially um, prairies with trees scattered in them. But the diversity of savanna is actually be even higher than prairies. You pick up some of this, this shade dependent plants of the woodland communities. Very few remnants of this. This is one of the highest quality remnants of a short leaf pine post oak savanna. It's at Fort Chaffee Military Base. And this old growth post oak savanna, uh, still intact, hundreds of species on the ground, also at Fort Chaffee. Uh, you'll see a pattern that the best savanna remnants left and best prairie remnants left in many places are on military bases. And that's in part for the fires that get started from military training and are allowed to burn across large areas, similar to fires naturally occurring uh, in the past that these ecosystems depend on. Um, incredible flora in these sites. This is a rare lily called death camas, very rare in most places, but just millions of them in the savannas at Fort Chaffee. Moving down the continuum, we get to woodlands. Woodlands are a more forested ecosystem, but space between the trees, uh, typically found in at least seasonally very dry upland habitats, or high river terraces in Arkansas. Um, imagine just an open forest with sun loving plants, as well as some of the shade dependent species. This is a remnant, a uh, old growth post oak savanna up in the Ozarks. Um, and you can see woodland sunflower dominating the, the ground floor there. It's a great woodland plant, semi shade, upland dry site conditions. Uh, Monarda fistulosa, excellent woodland plant here at a woodland restoration in the Boston mountains. Culver's root and a very high quality woodland restoration uh, up near the Buffalo River in Newton County. And then we have forests and forests are natural closed canopy systems, but they occur in specific land um, positions, landscape positions, where it's not especially dry in the summer. This is where we have a lot of our shade loving plants, our spring ephemerals. Some of these need sun, but they need it between the last freeze of the spring or the winter and the time the hardwood trees have fully leafed out. It's a real important time period there uh, for sun loving spring ephemerals. But then they a lot of times disappear later in the year by summer, or they slow their growth, put their energy into making seeds. They don't really grow anymore, and they can persist in that shade. This is where you want to look for your, your shade garden plants, things like ginseng. So I often ask land managers or gardeners, Think about your site. Is it a woodland site? Is it a forest site? Was it grasslands historically? These things can really, just a little understanding in that regard can really help you figure it out. Uh, there's certain questions you can ask yourself. I don't have time to go to all of them, but part of it is what was there historically the best of the ability to understand? And what are the uh, species present now, the trees in your yard, for example, if you have old trees that were there before the neighborhood? Uh, what are the, the vacant lots like? Do they still have native flora? What's the park like in your neighborhood, et cetera? Uh, what species are present? Things like the slope and aspect, what direction a site faces, how steep is it? Very important drivers of what can grow and grew historically or is happy in those sites. For example, south facing slopes, hotter, drier uh, than north facing slopes, very different flora, uh, all the way to the trees, uh, but certainly down in the in the in the herbaceous plants as well. Um, there are certain forest indicators that indicate you're in a forested site. You have a high diversity of hardwood trees and shrubs that are not adapted to drought and fire. Uh, many mature trees are tall and straight. They compete for light uh, when they grew there you know, originally. Uh, a general lack of pine. Pine is really a woodland species. It needs a little light to regenerate. High diversity of shade adapted understory plants that are happy there. Uh, not especially dry sites on average, and the landscape context, context that protected them from fire and wind and so on historically. 
uh, indicator trees, things like northern red oak, white oak, sugar maple, beech, magnolia, basswood, smaller trees and, and understory uh, shrubs such as spice bush, bladder nut, American holly, pawpaw, Carolina moonseed vine, um, yellow wood, Ohio buckeye, wild hydrangea, forest sites. And of course, all the rich shade loving wildflowers and ferns that you can garden with. Uh, woodland savanna indicators, very different setup, uh, typically a very low diversity of trees, maybe just a few drought tolerant uh, examples, but high diversity of sun loving wildflowers and grasses. Um, light dependent uh, landscape conditions that were more historically open. Um, and things like post oak, black jack oak, chinkapin oak, woodland species, often open grown, wider than tall in some cases, gnarly trees like this old growth post oak on Chenal Mountain in West Little Rock, 70 foot crown spread on the branches of this tree, three feet in diameter. In pine, shortleaf pine on acidic sites, Pine loves acid soil. Uh, you'll find shortleaf pine, you know you've got a woodland site. And then the rich diversity of open condition woodland and prairie wildflowers to choose from. Hundreds and hundreds of species uh, native to these ecosystems. All the milkweeds, some of the other folks are gonna talk about some of these plants. I'm gonna end on this point about growing your own plants. You're gonna get frustrated if like me, you kind of wanted to get beyond just the common four or five species you could find at the nursery. Of course, as before, a lot of these native plant nurseries have come about now, much better options today. But I still got really interested in the more obscure plants, uh, wanting to grow those from, from uh, seed. And, and I'm an avid seed collector. I'm the guy who's always taking a few seeds in their pocket and you know, try it out and stuff, um, important stuff and involve your, your friends and family. This is, um, I'm gonna go over time for about a minute here. Um, you know, cleaning your own seed with a screen, it's fun work. This is my daughter here doing what we call the coneflower stomp to bust the heads and get the seeds out. But different seeds of different plants, it's all related to these habitats and where they grow wild. What are the ecosystem processes there? What are the treatments needed for the seeds to get them to germinate, to break dormancy? These seeds are, have evolved to not just germinate at the wrong time. Anytime you water them, they, they have seasonality uh, in, in certain, certain plants needed to germinate after a fire, for example. A lot of them need light to germinate. The fine dust-like seeds, the really small seeds, don't bury those seeds. They need to be up on the surface of the ground, gently touching, pressed into the soil slightly. They need light to germinate. Different types I've got listed. You can look at the PDF. Some need a cold, moist stratification, which is essentially winter in the soil. Uh, they drop in the fall. A lot of our grassland plants and open woodland plants are this way. I do them in the refrigerator in moist sand in a Ziploc bag, different times for different species. Some need only a week. Others might need three months uh, of that cold, moist period to be tricked into to thinking they've been through the winter and to wake up and germinate. Um, others need warm, moist periods followed by cold, moist periods. Uh, a lot of these are some of the spring ephemerals, et cetera. Um, they drop in the spring, they go through the summer in the ground, then they go through the winter in the ground, then they germinate the following year. Um, some need scarification or, uh, oh, I missed one. Some are double dormant, they need a two year cycle. Uh, you can do that also artificially. Uh, again, some of the spring uh, ephemerals, the things like Solomon seal and bloodroot, dogwoods are this way. Scarification, things that need the seed coat broken or abraded. They would go through an animal in, in, the, in the wild, uh, the acid in their gut or a bird craw or something like that to be abraded. Um, you can do that with sandpaper or boiling water in many cases is a great treatment. And then others need to be planted fresh from seed. You can't let that seed dry out. Things like some of the other spring ephemerals, the trilliums, the um, bellworts, Dutchman's britches, et cetera, those need to be planted fresh. Don't let them dry out. Acorns even are this way of the oaks. So lots of things to learn. There's a lot of information out there, way more than there was 25 years ago when I first got into this stuff. And um, a lot to, to figure out. Thank you.
pardon me for calling. Now you're good. That is. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I think we're good. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Leslie Cooper. I'm the Arkansas Monarch and Pollinator Coordinator. I work for Quill Forever, and I'm the coordinator for the Arkansas Monarch Conservation Partnership. As Lynn mentioned, I should have asked the order of this before I agreed to it because I hate following Theo because he's just so knowledgeable. I'm like, I, I wish I knew the things that Theo knew. So together, we're going to do a little crash course on monarchs and pollinators, specifically native bees and monarch butterflies. I'll allude to a few other things, but I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to cruise right along. So native bees are very special to me. And the more that I learn about them, the more excited I get about them. So did you know that there's 4,000 species of native bees in North America? Um, they um, have special habitat requirements. They require foraging habitat, nesting habitat, and overwintering habitat. So that's going to kind of be my key message as I keep talking um, throughout the presentation. These are the things that you need to consider if you really want to benefit pollinators when you're planting natives. Um, I took this slide out, but I can't help myself. Um, in the state of Arkansas, experts estimate that we have between 400 and 650 species of native bees. And we actually don't know. That's a pretty wide range, right? It's 2023, and we still don't know how many native bee species we have. So thankfully, we're working with some uh, volunteers across the state and different agency folks so that we can do um, some bee monitoring so that we can get a species inventory so that we know what we have in the state so therefore we can protect them and the habitats that they depend on. So um, quickly, I want to talk about generalists versus specialists. So generalists, you can think of these bees or other creatures as not being very picky eaters. Um, you know, they generalize on what they can forage on. So these are kind of like the honeybees, the bumblebees, the butterflies. These are the species that really can nectar um, and forage on a variety of different species. Um, and then on the other hand, we have specialists. So these are the picky eaters. They specialize on either a certain species or a certain family of species. So like Lynn said, with host plant specialists that I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, um, but they require a certain species. And without that species, we wouldn't be able to support that pollinator. For example, there's a longhorn bee that, um, specializes on purple prairie clover. It's called Tetralonia albata, and it's actually been observed on two um, Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission sites. Um, it was Terre Noire in, near Ar Arkadelphia, and then another Blackland Prairie site, um, Grandview Prairie, which is actually a WA, I think. Theo can correct me. Anyway. So very quickly, I want to talk about European honeybees. So our beloved honeybees are very important pollinators to agriculture. They are managed pollinators. And I'm sure that there's beekeepers in the audience. Um, you know, they can also forage on native plants, but not a lot of people realize that they aren't actually native to North America. Um, all of the honeybees that we know and love are all the same species. They're all European honeybees, so it's Apis mellifera. Um, and if I have one issue, the only problem I have with honeybees is that they've really become the face for the plight of the pollinators, if you will. And the only reason why I don't like that is because if people hear, let's save the bees, what do you immediately think of? You think of honeybees, right? You think of bumblebees, maybe honeybees. Well, we have cellophane bees, mason bees, uh, leaf cutter bees, cuckoo bees. We have this huge diversity of native bees and no one knows about them. So very quickly, um, there's solitary bees and social bees. So um, solitary bees, um, more than 90% of our native bees are solitary. And this just means that the females of the species construct and provision their nests without any help from 
any other members of their species. So this means that they're typically less aggressive than honeybees because they're so busy trying to provision their nest. They're also not defending this horde of honey that they need to survive the winter, right? Um, so bumblebees and some sweat bees are the best known native socially nesting bees. So very quickly, because I love these fuzzy flying cows, uh, bumblebees, there's 51 bombus species in North America and they're considered cavity nesters. So, sorry, I feel like I'm like leaning forward. Thank you. Okay. So they're considered cavity nesters. They nest in tree cavities, but more often than not, they use abandoned rodents nests, but they can also nest um, under tussocks of grass, as you can see in the photo on the bottom. Um, bumblebees are special because they are capable of something called sonication or buzz pollination. And this is something that honeybees cannot do. So basically because they're such large bees, they have very strong flight muscles. So they're able to kind of disengage that muscle and vibrate at a certain frequency so that they're able to effectively extract pollen from um, certain flowers. So this makes them um, particularly good at pollinating crops like blueberries or tomato plants. Um, unlike honeybees, they do form annual colonies. So only the new queens overwinter, which is again, one of the many reasons why leaving the leaves and creating that overwintering habitat, um, or at least taking it into consideration when you're planting your natives is really important. So 70% uh, of our native bees are solitary ground nesters. So this is particularly important because we really don't recommend a lot of soil disturbance when you're establishing a garden or even doing large scale restoration. Um, so these ground nesting bees dig in sparsely vegetated or bare soil and it can vary from flat ground to vertical banks, um, and the configurations can be short, simple tunnels, or they can be complex branching structures. So it kind of depends on the species. But remember, bare soil in your garden is very important, even if it's just under the plants. So um, there's also wooden tunnel nesting bees. Sometimes these are called stem nesting bees, um, and this makes the other this makes up the other 30% of our native bees. Most of them use abandoned beetle burrows and uh, standing dead trees or limbs, but some of them can also chew out the soft pith instead of stems and twigs. Um, some of our native shrubs are great species and examples for this, but there are forbs that they can also use. I have a great resource on the Quell Forever table outside that I highly recommend that you consult with. So I can't talk about tunnel nesting uh, bees without talking about bee houses because people are very concerned. They're like, okay, I want to help native bees. I'm like, awesome. So just be wary of any mass produced bee houses because they may not be the proper dimensions for our Arkansas native bees. Anything larger than about five eighths is really too large of a tube or straw for them to use. So you're really just creating habitat for um, like pest species, which if you're trying to do that, that's fine. Like spiders or wasps, for example. Um, the other problem is, is they may not be able to be properly sanitized because they're glued together. So imagine staying in a hotel that's never seen housekeeping. It's just asking for, you know, disease and parasites to spread. Um, especially since most of these are solitary bees, you're also unnaturally, um, congregating these species together. So it could lead to greater ramifications for um, like taking out a species or spreading disease. Um, so I really recommend these Xerces Society handouts. They have a bunch of great handouts on their website, but um, the one that I have printed out for y'all on the Quill Forever table is the brown one. I like this one better than the green one because it does talk about um, proper maintenance. So remember, if you're truly wanting to help native bees, the messaging always comes back to planting Arkansas native plants. So very quickly, I'm not gonna read through it because I'm gonna mention it a little bit later. Basically, if you leave your garden messy over the winter, um, not only are you creating food for birds that Dr. Dan will talk about, I like to call them nature's bird feeder. Um, and then in the spring, once uh, temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees, you can chop that off 
but leave some stubble. And then the next growing season, that stubble will be hidden by that year's growth. And then um, it can still provide a nesting site for native bees. So, and then in the spring, you start this, the whole process over again. So switching gears from native bees to talk about butterflies, namely monarchs is the example that I'm going to use. Um, butterflies, I thought I had animations, oh well. Um, so butterflies undergo a four-stage life cycle. They undergo complete metamorphosis. So as we learned in kindergarten, um, they start out as a teeny tiny egg and then they hatch into a caterpillar. Most caterpillars have five instars, monarchs do. That's what I'm going to use as my example. Um, and then they crawl away from their host plant and form a chrysalis. Butterflies make chrysalises, moths make cocoons. Um, and then after a period of time, they eclose out of their uh, chrysalis and emerge as an adult butterfly. So the timing does depend on species. For monarch butterflies, they can go from egg to adult in about a month. Um, and there are obviously migratory and non-migratory species. Monarchs famously have a 3,000 mile migration that stretches um, from central Mexico into southern Canada. Um, so, but some of them do not migrate. So again, that's where the overwintering habitat really comes into play. So as Lynn mentioned, with most lep lepidopter species, monarch caterpillars are host plant specialists. So they specialize on milkweeds. As Theo mentioned, we have 21 native milkweed species in the state of Arkansas. So from left to right, I'm going to use the scientific names, and then I'll give you the common names. We have um, Asclepius hertella, Asclepius incarnata, Asclepius verticillata, and Asclepius viridis. So it's tall green milkweed, swamp milkweed, world milkweed, and green antelope horn milkweed. Um, so as you can see, all of them are host plants for the monarch butterfly. Monarch caterpillar, excuse me. But unlike our caterpillars, monarch butterflies are generalist pollinators. So they're able to nectar on a variety of different um, wildflowers. So this is just my slide to remind me that um, Arkansas is in the spring and fall migratory pathway. So it's particularly important to remember to plant flowers that bloom very early in the spring because we're already seeing monarchs. Um, and very late into the fall so that you can literally fuel the monarch migration as they travel back to their overwintering sites in Mexico. So you're here, right? So you're already helping. You're going to create pollinator habitat and you're going to grow native. So when I talk about monarch and pollinator habitat and when our partners across the state talk about monarch and pollinator habitat, I want you to know that we're talking about a high diversity of native blooming plants. plants. Excuse me that bloom throughout the entire growing season so that we can provide a constant supply of nectar and pollen to our pollinators. We also include a diversity of flower sizes, shapes, and structures so that we can um, benefit those generalists as well as the specialists. We also want to include those Arkansas native milkweeds so that um, we can help our monarch friends, and we are managing to benefit all pollinators and wildlife. Remember, I work for Quell Forever, so great pollinator habitat is also great bobwhite habitat. So your pollinator habitat can really look like a variety of different things I like to call I like to call pollinator habitat the little black dress of conservation because it can really go anywhere. Uh, so what do you plant? I want you to try and maximize the diversity um, for your area. If you have a smaller yard, you're probably not going to be able to fit as many plants as someone that has a huge yard that they're converting the whole thing. Remember, the goal is to provide a succession of blooms. Um, you know, from early spring to late fall, um, so that our pollinators have that constant supply. And as a general rule of thumb, remember that the more plant diversity we have, the greater insect diversity we're able to support on the landscape. Don't forget the host plants. If you have a deep love for monarchs or tiger swallowtails, you're going to want to make sure that you're including their um, host plant in your garden. Remember, the target is... Um, to aim for at least 70% native plants on your entire footprint, but more is better. Um, the threshold is important. I'll talk about that in a second, but um, non-natives can provide some benefit. I get that question a lot, but just because it blooms doesn't mean it's good for bees. So please know your natives, 
do not plan invasive species. I have a handout for that too. Um, and Doug Talmy and one of his grad students did a research paper. Um, and they found that landscapes with less than 70% native vegetation are considered food deserts and habitat sinks because they weren't able to successfully rear um, a clutch of chickadees um, to adulthood. So if you want to plant for pollinators and birds, uh, make sure that you're planting native plants. So I have this handout from the Xerces Society on the Quell Forever table as well. Remember that bees and pollinators need, need more than just flowers. So leave the leaves, um, use it as a natural mulch. Remember that caterpillars and pupae of um, different Lepidoptera species can be overwintering in those leaves. Reconsider how much you mulch. Um, you can kind of do a reverse mulch and use it to um, make pathways throughout your garden. And Heather Holm, another author of some great books that I really recommend, um, she just says that she plants more plants, which I think is really cool. Um, you can also plant a log and leave the stubble so that you can create habitat, like the nesting habitat for those um, stem, and wood nesting bees. And you can also postpone your garden cleanup again until temperatures are consistently above 50 degrees. So this is a slide that I stole from Coleman Little, the real bee expert, but I won't uh, bore you with the details, but basically you can see the difference um, in small native bees and large native bees. Um, but remember the take home message, for foraging habitat needs to be really close to nesting habitat because some of our smaller native bees can't forage that far away. I hate the phrase, what's the best pollinator plants to plant? Um, but if you insist, you can, I kind of generalized, the best pollinator plants that you can plant in your yard are the native plants that will grow in your yard. So remember, because you're planting natives, you're gonna benefit pollinators. Um, I have these wonderful resources on the Arkansas Monarch Conservation Partnership table. Uh, and if you are a landowner that's interested in learning more about cost share programs, Oh, I'm so sorry, y'all. I almost made it 15 minutes. Um, if you're a landowner interested in receiving free technical assistance or learning more about state and federal cost share programs, we have some of our farm bill biologists here. If you'd like to learn more, please stop by the Quill Forever booth. So plant a diversity of Arkansas native plants so that you can provide a constant supply of nectar and pollen through March through November. Please remove invasive species from your yard so you're not contributing to the problem and consider all aspects of habitat, foraging, nesting, and overwintering habitat, and don't forget those host plants. So thank you very much. Hello. Well, I assume you're all here in part because you are all interested in making your yard a more bird-friendly yard, or your church yard, or your school yard. I'm going to say yard in general, but it applies to all those different spaces. And, the, of course, the foundation to a bird-friendly yard is native plants, because native plants provide the food that our native birds have evolved with, adapted to, recognized as a food source and provide the right kind of nutrition at the right time of year. Uh, and of course, especially insects are really the key for native plants as we're trying to drive home here because 96% of all land birds feed their young 
insects, not fruit, not seeds, not nectar, insects. So got to have native plants to support the native insects to feed the baby birds, especially caterpillars, which are soft little packets of fat and protein that are easy to cram down a baby bird's mouth. We already know now that oaks, for example, support a heck of a lot of caterpillars. So another source for learning what is native in your area is National Audubon Society's Plants for Birds database. You can also just Google Audubon Plants for Birds and you enter your zip code and it will give you a list of plants that are native to your area and also list the birds that are benefited by those plants. Another advantage on our website is that there's a resource tab where you can find organizations that know about native plants and vendors where you can buy native plants from. Uh, one challenge, of course, is that there are a limited number of vendors in Arkansas that specialize in natives. Many of them are here today. There are uh, several that have popped up in Northwest Arkansas, but not everyone lives near a native plant supplier. So this is another way you can all help is by demanding native plants. If you go to your local nurseries and say, here's a list I printed out from Audubon of these plants, I want these plants. The more of us that do it, the more we show there's a demand, the more the supply will increase to, to meet that need. And Audubon, we have spring and fall native plant sales. We sell plants and we bring together some of the vendors that are here today to sell plants through us. You have just missed the opportunity to buy plants from us for our spring sale. Pickup is, is this coming week. Uh, but if you come to my table, you can sign up, be on our email list, get the notification for our fall sale. And also we are most likely going to have a post-sale sale at the Little Rock Audubon Center for leftover plants. So get on, email, on our email list so you can learn when we're going to have that. And then there are other things you can do to make your yard better for birds. Uh, again, there's the, the leaf habitat. Maybe we can call it fallen leaves because the insects, uh, so many insects require those fallen leaves to complete their annual life cycle and the birds know it. That's why you see birds like wood thrushes, hermit thrushes, towhees, white-throated sparrows. They're all sifting through the leaf litter, looking for the insects that are hiding in those leaves. And if you bag up all those leaves and put them to the curb, you're getting rid of all that biomass and all that bird food. And I'm, I'm leaving the leaves in my garden bed and my native plants are having no problem coming up through all of that leaves, the leaf biomass and growing up just fine. And then those fallen leaves are also beneficial because they help to uh, protect the plant roots from cold weather, they retain soil moisture, they break down and provide free nutrients for your garden, uh, and also help to keep the weeds down. So lots of benefits to having leaves in your garden beds. We can also provide food for birds, supplemental way by having bird feeders. How many of you feed birds at home? Great, great. Uh, Remember that we feed birds because we enjoy it, because we want to bring the birds closer to us to observe, not because they depend on our seed for survival, because even the most common feeder birds are still getting a lot of their food from natural sources. It's really like in the most freezing, icy weather that they really need our feeders. The most important thing to know, though, is to keep your feeders clean. Every couple of weeks, Take your feeders down, hot soapy water, maybe weak vinegar bleach solution, or put them in the dishwasher if the dishwasher's safe, because birds spread disease in part by coming in contact with each other or with uh, contaminated fecal matter on bird feeders. So we've got to help prevent the spread of disease by keeping our feeders clean. Every couple of weeks or any time it rains and the seed gets wet or you see any mold growing, clean them out. Same thing with the bird baths too. All birds need water, even if they're not going to come to your feeders at all. 
especially in dry times, freezing times, but you got to keep your bird baths clean to prevent the spread of disease even more often than your bird feeders, especially in warm weather when they get all that algal growth in them, birds poop in the bird bath, they bathe in the bird bath, got to keep it clean, fresh water, daily basis for those birds. It's also important to provide nest and shelter for the birds, like you would do for the bees and the butterflies. So have dense cover, shrubs, evergreen, dense ground cover, places where birds can find shelter from the elements, from predators, and build their nests to make the next generation. And there is research that shows that native plants provide better cover than non-native plants. That there is a higher nest success in native plants because they have a more dense nest uh, leaf and branching structure to provide better cover for the nests. Snags, standing dead trees, dead parts of trees. If these are not an immediate threat to your house or your neighbor's property, leave them standing. Because of course, woodpeckers will excavate cavities in these trees. Lots of other cavity nesters take over woodpecker nests or nest in natural cavities in dead trees. Insects are eating that dead wood, and that's what the birds are going after. And they make great perches for swallows and kites and hawks and great things like that. Uh, and if you do have a tall dead tree and you're afraid it's going to fall down and hit something, then consider just cutting it off at like 10 to 20 feet. So it's not going to fall and crush your house, but it will still provide all the benefits of being food and habitat for birds and other wildlife. We also need to eliminate some of the threats that birds face in our yards. And one of the big ones are window collisions. It's one of the biggest sources of mortality of birds. An estimated 1.5 billion birds die from window collisions every year. Birds cannot see glass. They don't know what that is. Instead, they see a reflection of the outdoors and they either smack into it and die or hit it, bounce off, and unfortunately, Many of those birds die later on from internal injuries. Fortunately, there are many easy solutions to preventing the collisions. Basically, we've got to create a visual barrier between the windows and the birds, break up that reflection, let them know they can't fly through here. Now, a lot of people turn to stickers, but you can't, first of all, you can't put a sticker on the inside. That's not going to break up the reflection. And then you can't just put a sticker here, sticker there, and think it's going to work because research has found that birds can fly through gaps as small as two by four, or even two by two for some of the smaller birds, like hummingbirds. So you've got to have a regular grid pattern that is really small, two by four, two by two, regular rows of dots, regular stripes, or whole screens or whole nets over the window. Uh, I believe uh, Wild Birds Unlimited does sell some of these products you can put on your windows, and you can also buy them online, too. One of my favorite ways to help birds is to drink certified bird-friendly coffee. And it's certified bird-friendly because not only is it shade grown under the canopy of trees, it's actually grown under the canopy of native bird habitat. Most coffee is grown in the sun. So basically, they clear cut the forest, grow the coffee in the sun. But coffee really is a shade plant. Uh, so they grow it in the, where they grow it under the canopy of native habitat. It provides habitat for birds. Research has found that shade grown coffee plantations provide for a diversity of bird species. The birds, in turn, provide natural insect control for the coffee plants. Uh, and also the benefit of bird-friendly coffee that is also is certified organic, shade-grown, fair trade, all that good stuff. Um, in Little Rock, there are various places that have sold certified bird-friendly coffee, like Whole Foods, Natural Grocers, uh, Green Corner Store, Wild Birds Unlimited has, have it, has had it. We can also buy it online, places like Thanksgiving Coffee Company or Birds and Beans. I'm on a, a birds and beans subscription. So uh, when I start to run supply, run low on supplies, I get my next bag of coffee and I keep on going. So look for that certified bird friendly label. 
And then you can also help by making your bird watching count for the birds by participating in community science projects like the Great Backyard Bird Count, Christmas Bird Count, eBird, Project Feeder Watch, where uh, all of our individual sightings can add up to a big picture of how birds are doing on a large scale and over time. And this is how we ornithologists know how bird populations are doing, which ones are declining, which ones are increasing, where the problem areas are, and figure out what we need to do to help the birds. And then last but not least, you can help us by spreading the bird word or the plants or birds word by getting signage to show you're a bird-friendly yard. And you can um, go to Audubon Delta's sister organization, Arkansas Audubon Society. They've got a table here and you can figure out how to get your yard certified as a bird-friendly yard. Basically, you do the things that we've been talking about today, plant natives, kill invasives, treat your windows, keep cats indoors, get points for the things that you do, and then you get your certified bird-friendly yard sign. Or even if you don't yet have enough points to be certified, you can still submit your application and get your working to become certified sign so that you can put that in your yard and that's an opportunity for your neighbors, your friends, your family to say, hey, what is that all about? And you can tell them the ways you are making your yard better for birds and be part of our statewide network of certified bird-friendly yards. Thank you. It's the format. We'll have to, we'll go with it. Yeah, it's, there. it's just that one. Well, hi, everybody. We're the comic relief. <laughs> so, should have gone first. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm Ann Holcomb. David Holcomb. And we're going to talk to you about what to do and what not to do to start a pollinator garden or just natural habitat in your yard. Okay, so we put this together with the idea of individuals that maybe were just starting out, didn't have any information about pollinator garden or native plants. So if there's nobody here that it applies to, that's actually a good thing. It means we've got a lot of allies, so we're going to run with this. So educate yourself about plants and wildlife in your yard. Uh, there's a lot of information on the internet, of course, that's available to you. Personally, I prefer venues such as this because you've got the experts here you can ask questions and you can get feedback from them. Uh, John Muir has a certain quote that I really liked. He said, uh, I need to get back into the mountains to learn the news. So that sort of applies if you're just starting out and getting some basic information. You really need to get outside, get into your yard, try to identify uh, some native plants as well, well as some wildlife species. These are located in our yard. We have uh, the, the 
spider is actually an orb weaver. It's uh, we see it every couple of years, so it's it's a really unusual spider. We have about three species of snakes in our yard, and we have uh, box turtles that are breeding, and we were able to catch them actually uh, laying eggs. So we use box turtles as uh, before before we do anything in our yard. It's the question we ask is how does this affect the box turtle or box turtle habitat? So they've really got a rough go of it. So uh, they're a special uh, species in our yard. There we go. Okay. A lot of what will happen once you start getting out in your yard, and if you've done this, I mean, it's all a process, right? So if you've already done this or you continue to do it, it will only enhance how you change along the way, because we tend to put ourselves outside of nature. It's just like, well, here we are, and here's all the natural world out there and stuff. We are so much a part of it. The connections, all the interrelations, everything is connected. And the more we get in touch with that, with ourselves, and realize we're not here to dominate it or control it or whip it into shape, we're a part of it. We, we go to the yard every day to learn the news, just like John Muir did for the mountains. So your perspective is going to change. This is a world mountain mint in our yard. And we're no, we no longer, I don't know that we ever really did say, oh, have you looked at the leaves on the plants today? But now it's just like, hey, something's eating the mountain mint. Look, it's a leaf cutter bee. Yay. You know, so, you know, that's, that's a thing. So if you're starting a pollinator garden, you want to start small. This we were supposed to talk about mistakes we made. This was, without a doubt, the biggest mistake I made. I was working full time and came home and I said, hey, Ann, I got rid of the lawnmower. We're not mowing anymore. So uh, that's led to a lot of frustration. So start small helps avoid frustration unless you've got a lot of time to spend. Uh, you can start small. It gives a sense of accomplishment. If you complete a little area and you can look at it and you've got uh, pollinators coming in. Uh, plus, native plants can be expensive and hard to find. So if you're doing a small area, you'll have much better luck, I think, in finding what you're looking for than if you try to do the whole yard like I started out doing. Okay, so once you select a site, uh, you need some information for choosing the right plant. The first thing is, what is the light at that site? So full sun is about six hours a day, part sun three to six hours a day, less than three hours is shade. So you have to, you know, some species can grow in shade or sun. They don't really care. They just, they just want to be there and start growing. But other ones are more uh, specific in their requirements. It's like, it's like a microcosm of what Theo was talking about. To, it's all related. I mean, and the same thing with, with moisture in your yard and the terrain. I mean, do you have loamy soil? Is it sandy, um, clay-based? You're going to be retaining water. What's the slope? Do you have it? Does it all wash down to the bottom of your yard or are you, are you on a different kind of hill? All of those things matter. And for some kinds of plants, depending on what it is, it can matter a whole lot. Yeah, just we've learned mostly by trial and error. And the other thing is like you can, I mean, look at books, look at stuff online, uh, all of those things, but go out to natural areas and look at what plants do there. See what, see what you can see and notice. And it takes some time before you really are seeing, you know. But um, I mean, do you have, do you like Zen things? Are you very minimalist in your prose approach, very neat and formal? You can do that with native plants. Do you like more of a wild woolly approach? This is like our yard, I think, where things are, are just natural and, and go kind of wherever they want to go. Um, do you have a smaller space like containers? Uh, you can still do pollinator stuff big time with container plants. It doesn't have to be, you know, tons of acreage. We have a relatively small yard, but I think a lot of things in it. If you like xeriscaping or desert plants, there's there's a space for that with 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 habitat. So, and then finally, I think a lot of our backyard was, it's, it was defined by our dogs 
uh, they because they would run paths and it's like hmm looks like something's emerging there so we just kind of went with the dogs and now we have these paths that s sort of separate sections but dogs are a huge part of a lot of our lives you know and so are kids I mean you've got to you've got to take into account who uses the yard what's happening with it and and make that work too that's part of the part of the fun of it it's all a process uh, it's also important to don't be afraid to make mistakes because we have made a lot of them. Uh, even the most experienced gardeners make a lot of mistakes. So experiment with design, with plant choices, and label what you plant. We're not really good about this, but if you want to keep that swamp milkweed that you planted and you're really excited about it and uh, yeah, well, something happens. To well, it happened, but there was so much happening then, too. So the swamp milkweed disappeared, and then it was just like, oops, sorry about that. And then there were, we were overgrown with native plants that were aggressive and some invasive plants that were aggressive and the parsley that was great, but it's just like, my gosh, this is a forest of it. And so it was just kind of a bad day. We have a lot of oops and things. And one thing I would say, if you do see something that you don't recognize, it's like, hmm, I wonder what this blooming thing with thorns is. Let's see what happens. Find out what it is, because otherwise you too will have horse nettle that grows to nine feet tall, and you'll be getting rid of it for the next 90 years. Or longer. <laughs> okay, so plant for three seasons. Uh, pollinators require, of course, resources in spring, summer, and fall. Uh, we always recommend that you plant not just one plant, but multiple plants, because you, it's possible to lose a species during the season, and then there would be nothing for them. Uh, and that's part of the idea between planning for biodiversity. Uh, also, with aesthetic design, a lot of yards that we see don't seem to have a lot of like native grasses or native sedges. Uh, these are important elements, especially grasses for overwintering of na native bees. And then plant what you can find or purchase reliably. These are all things that everybody else has said, but just, just reiterate do the homework and, and find out. There's annuals and biennials and perennials. There's you know, some bloom just for one year, some for two years, some for three. Sometimes you bumble up your slides and so you actually aren't showing any annuals because none of yours came back. So you have to, it's a perennial, biennial, perennial. But in some areas, daisy flea, flea vane is an annual, so apologies to you people who know better. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't change that slide. We noticed it too late. Oh. Uh, oh, that was mine. Yeah. This was uh, Benjamin Vogt, um, is a naturalist in Nebraska. Lynn mentioned him. This is from one of his books. Maybe it's a new book, but it's Sleep, Creep, and Leap, which is a phrase if you garden you're probably familiar with. But the first year, plants are going to be establishing their, their root system. They're going to not do a lot. They're building all that infrastructure. The second year, they will creep, and you'll see some stuff. And the third year, if they like where they are, and they like their soil, and their habitat, and their moisture, and everything, they're going to leap. So but that's, that's three years into it, so it takes time. It's not an instant thing. And some people will try to plant native plants because they think, oh, well, this will be easier. I won't have to work. Huh? No, you have to do just as much work. Okay, so we're going to give just a little bit of information on pesticides. Uh, herbicides and insecticides are the only two we're really going to talk about. It's just a brief information. Yeah, very brief. For the most part, herbicides just don't. There's not much in it that's good for, for native gardeners. One exception, if you have, say you've cut down a calorie pear because you couldn't dig it out or whatever and you've got this little stump there, do this in the fall when the, when the plants are already drawing everything back into themselves. Take some Roundup glyphosate, wear gloves, put it in a jar, add a splash of food coloring so you can see what you're doing. And then within, I think you may have a 15 minute window, the sooner the better. After you've cut that, then slather it with the glyphosate and it will, if, if it doesn't kill it, it will at least slow it down so you can get another pass at it later. So, but you can do that with woody vines of, and you can paint leaves of things, but do it in the fall and that's the only time. I would never just indiscriminately spray the stuff. <laughs> one, exce one exception is oh, insecticides, sorry. Um, just don't use them because they're not selective. They'll kill, any, they'll kill all the undesirable stuff, but they'll also kill things that you want. Um, exceptions might be fire ants, don't have time to get into a lot of it, don't know a whole lot. It's just that do the research between fire ant bait and granules. Um, 
they all of those things will also kill other ants, not just fire ants. But they're a species. The only thing that that uses them is a, a forid fly and a lay an egg in their brain. Um, they, they, their only other predator is us. So it's it's an ongoing problem, and we can talk more about that in questions and answers if you have if you have questions about it. But mosquitoes, there is hope. So uh, this is something I think everybody's going to be interested in. So effective mosquito control, uh, it's real important that you start this early. If you wait too long into the season, then you're going to get some replication. Mosquitoes are building their numbers at that point. You're going to be much less effective. So source reduction, remove standing water, uh, and early intervention. You guys should like this. This is buckets of doom. So. Um. No matter what the people who come around and spray mosquitoes commercially say that they use, that, oh, this is safe, it is not safe. The sprays that they use will kill other pollinators. They will kill butterflies, moths, lightning bugs. They will hurt toads and frogs. Um, it's just not a good thing to be doing. Plus, those commercial sprays will kill about 10% of adult mosquitoes only. Don't do anything about the hordes of mosquitoes coming up who are not adults. So you have to keep coming back, and it's expensive, and it's bad. So don't do that. BTI is your friend. Um, it stands for Bacillus thuringiensis subspecies israelensis. So just call it BTI. It's much easier. Um, and it will only kill the larvae of mosquitoes and black fly and fungus gnats, but those aren't a problem for us. So it's just the mosquito part. So what? And the, the mosquito dunks are the form that you'll find it in most. You can sometimes find granules as well, or you can break up a mosquito dunk. One dunk like that will go last about um, a month for 100 square feet of water. So that's pretty good. So what we're gonna do, or tell you how to do, is do a, a bucket of doom. You take a mosquito dunk, you put it in a bucket, and we there are studies that show Mosquitoes are attracted to black, orange, red, and cyan. So if you've got that color bucket, great. If not, just use a bucket. It's fine. It's not rocket science. It's a bucket. And put a handful of grass in it, put your mosquito or straw, whatever you've got there, uh, in the dunk and fill it about halfway with water and put a stick in it. And show them ours. This is our experiment. We have four right now, one in each corner of the yard. And after the rain a couple of nights ago, they, they all overflowed, so we're kind of starting over with it. But, after, and that's not that big a deal. Uh, still, put the mosquito dunk in there. One dunk will last a good long time, or you can quarter it up and whatever. But the, the, this generates, as, as the stuff you put in there ferments, it's this irresistible fragrance to female mosquitoes. And they will come and lay their eggs in the bucket just above the water line, and then the larva will fall up all off into the water where you have cleverly put this mosquito dunk and no more mosquitoes from there. And it's not just like one mosquito will come and use this bucket. They will come. They will come do that. So if you're keeping your bird bath cleaned out and any other, no more standing water or, or breaking up mosquito dunks and putting them wherever you've got it, that should make a big, big difference. So we're, we're hopeful. We have one to give away as a door prize. We'll treasure it always. And Walt Disney uses this method too, so maybe it's yeah Disney really World in Florida. Yeah. That's a good endorsement. It's yeah. In Florida, mosquitoes, and they use buckets of doom, and not yeah. not a commercial spray. Okay, so we've kind of been over this, but why not native invasives are a problem? They're aggressive spreaders, and they will replace native communities. Uh, insects rarely eat them, and they're not part of the local food web. We've already, we've already covered the big ones, the Nandina, honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle, calorie pear, English ivy, Chinese privet. We have them all in our yard, and we, we, used, to. we used to. We don't have quite so many now, but still working on some. Okay. Removing non-native invasives, so uh, identify the problem species, and there are several appropriate methods to remove. One, uh, the selective herbicide use that we already talked about, and... Um, you can dig it out, it, like we have this humongous ivy bed that somebody thought was a great idea way back when, and we're still trying to dig it out. And we have discovered that if you mow it or weed eat it a little bit, and then you know water it or wait for rain, then it's not really that bad to dig out, but it's just time consuming, at least for us, because it's a huge amount of ivy. And you need to be careful when you do that, because 
even if it's an invasive species, turtles still use it, other, other rodents, uh, snakes. It's, it's good habitat, even though it's an invasive species and you don't want it. So just be careful when you do things like that, because you're in somebody's home that's not necessarily yours. Um, and the other thing you could do, we tried doing smothering it with cardboard, but it didn't work because the ivy was too springy, I think is a technical word. Um, but you can, use, you can use cardboard to smother grass or, or, or flatter things, and it works pretty well. Okay, so what, I want to say a few words about Arkansas Wild Spaces. It's a relatively new program in CAM. We're starting our third year. Uh, it's designed to help homeowners choose native plants. And these usually are homeowners that are either they're going big in their yard or maybe they're too busy to actually do the research needed to get the right plants, or they just want a lot more diversity than what they're seeing available. There is a certification that we can do. There are three levels of it, but in any level of certification, you get this great sign that you can put up in your yard. And if you've got a POA or an HOA, maybe that will help. Maybe not. But uh. yeah, Lynn Foster started this program. She went to a, a conference in St. Louis that Doug Ptolemy, where he was, and uh, came back with the ideas. And we started it with Cam. Janet Lanza manages it now. Uh, it's all based on Douglas Ptolemy's theories and pretty much everything I even think about now is goes with his theories and stuff so uh, on the cam table there are these if you want more information about it it's a good way if you need a little bit of help because of all the incredible amounts of information then people can come to your help, house and help you do that so. and we'd like to end with this one slide because I think you can substitute land with nature if you need to, but it's from Aldo Leopold, who wrote A Sand County Almanac. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect because we are part of it, and it's, we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And when we realize that, then that's how you grow a pollinator garden. Thanks to all of our speakers. Um, we're going to change out, out the format just a tiny bit. We are going to give you all a half an hour break right now. And I can tell you, because I went out there just a few minutes ago, the plant sellers are out there. There are many plants, and they are waiting for you. So go visit those plant sellers. Come back in 30 minutes. If you wrote down questions for us, drop them off. And we'll do a Q&A session that lasts no longer than 45 minutes, possibly less if we run out of questions. And then after that, you'll be free to go revisit the plant sellers. They'll be around until 2 o'clock this afternoon. So we'll see you in 30 minutes. Thank you so much. And who would not want the bucket of doom?
20.
food? How do we get rid of this non-native invasive nuisance? You are correct, it is non-native. You are correct, it is very invasive. And somebody want to raise a hand and start on this one? I have never personally had to get rid of the food for which I'm very grateful. But I just talked to you, Kevin Shane, who's a very, very um, versatile out there. And he has, he has had like an acre of it to get rid of, which is very daunting. You cannot, he said, all you can do is pull it out. You can't, you know, kind of cutting and painting it does nothing. Um, it puts out like these 40 foot runners that are just other walls. Um, so what he said he does is wait until winter and get it wet or when it is wet or something, and go out with a pickaxe and whatever you can, I mean, it's, it's a hard job, he's still working on it. And it started from the, from the outside of his big patch of it and going in. Uh, he just chops, chops it up with a the, the pickaxe and then, you know, pulls up those, those runners. If you, you, know, you pull that line, he goes, you know. And then that's it. And then, boiling water over it again and again and again. It will kill it. I've done it. If you pour boiling water over bamboo, and you may have to do it multiple times, it will kill it. I, I've done it. 
So I, I cut it back and then I poured water over the boiling water over it like maybe twice and it was gone. So Anybody else have anything to contribute on that? Can we get that on this? Things to ban? I don't know. Because just because it's so invasive. I know. We can start a petition. I have an idea myself. Nothing that I 
haven't been able to pull out with the polar bear. It's just not that big. Does anybody have experience with uh, older men and women, thicker men? Does the cut and paint work? I would assume it does. But the big ones, thank you. But the, the big ones, I, I can't touch them. I'm not having to cut them down, but they pop right back up. So, okay. Whack and pull. Over this boiling water would help. We'll try. We'll try to make this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sweet gum trees, because I got a lot in some woods, and I don't know how they um, affect the habitat. So. Thank you. 
trying to eradicate the gum trees so that you can plant more like wildflowers, oh. yeah, native wildflowers, you're providing more of a benefit, I would argue, than leaving those sweet, sweet gums for the moment. I like the flower seeds too, you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> it quick search on the Google says that a sweet gum is a keystone plant for the earth board. I'm the bird man. I'm going to say there are many bird apps out there too. <laughs> We're identifying find birds as Merlin, which is a free app. Right? You answer a series of questions about the birds you're seeing, and we'll give you a narrow list of species that may be, and you can investigate from there. And Merlin can also identify birds from your photos and my sound too. And Theo is my app. Harder and harder to stunt by naturalists. It's artificial intelligence. Every time you
you identify something on there, you know it weren't and you know, it's kind of scary for a lot of ways, but um you know, trade it all. I know, so it's I said I have friends who are botanists and they said, if you go on there you're training your replacement place. <laughs> you know, I can sort of assume what they're saying. But um, you know, it's it's always gonna have trouble with something. But uh, for common species, even even a, not even that great photo anymore. You can usually get it in the top couple of uh, options. And I like it too for what what she said about you, know, you can interact with other people, get in the discussions that happen in there, and, and you can easily put other photos of the same species nearby and all that. And, and there's a great there's a great um, need for people to take multiple pictures of plants. You know, not just Every year I get a goldenrod flower head zoomed in. Which, what's, what plant is this? Well, that's one of 32 different goldenrod species. They all look the same unless you get the whole plant. You know, taking different parts of the plant is helpful if you're really close to something.
They're probably tank colors, caterpillars, tank a lot of the tree. A quick note about the school there are specific funding opportunities available to school and conservation districts. So it's um, through our funding and fish, but it's administrated through rural services. But if you Google AGSB conservation education grants, um, you can, uh, the, it's usually the application is usually due at the end of October. So now is a great time to start researching if that's something that you're interested in doing at that school. Um, so since you came in late, in case you didn't know, through these doors, there's a lot of native plant sellers that are selling these native plants that we're talking about. And there's also a lot of handouts. I really encourage you to stop by the Fall Forever uh, booth. I have a very thick like species list. It's not all of the native species in Arkansas, but it does have little icons next to it showing like what it benefits. Um, you know, butterflies, bees, and birds, the so, like. Um, but yes, you should uh, definitely Google like what goes with them to do if, you, if you're trying to benefit like a specific garden, like monarchs, for example, you have to plant those weed species 
and then we have a guy for Rockland County and the there's a lot of resources. If you will give me your email address, I will send PDFs of all these presentations to you, so you'll have a lot of information to take away from, from this. Um, and also, I meant to get it in the my last one is here, if it's not too late to get it in Okay. <laughs> Okay. The C H E R. She needs to get the thing. There's a really good orange brochure that Damon Fisher puts out. It's at the Arkansas Heritage National Heritage Commission table and it lists plant by their blue pine. All good plants from farm leaders, all farm plants. So I think you've got your lottery. Good. I think uh, next we're going to go ahead and do the lottery drawing. Uh, I think we're going to probably need to go to the Vermont tickets, get our winners. So we will do that. And um, if we can all just say thanks to our experts here. We're going to start to do that. All right, um, Liliana. Liliana is going to draw for us. Okay. Four. We've got gift certificates for Native Son. We've got a beautiful poster about the gift packers. We've got a free version of Nature's Best Hope for Kids. And don't let me forget the bucket of doom. Six, five, nine, three, six, one. All right, I'm getting six, five, nine, three, six, four. I'm going to read the last three numbers. Three, seven, one. Yeah, we should be good then. Three, six, six. Yay! Come back. Okay, we have two winners. Three, four, one.